Good morning and welcome everybody to Cyversus Focus Forum webinar. My name's Tina Lee and I'm the Cyvers user engagement uh, person. <laughs> uh, today's webinar is Going Places With Your Containers by Tyson Swetnam. And today's webinar will be approximately 30 minutes long with lots of time for Q&A at the end. Um, I want to cover a bit of housekeeping first. Please open your Zoom chat window and type any questions you may have there. Um, we'll cover those at the end. Also, at the end of the webinar, we'll post all the, uh, the video and the chat into a wiki page, which we will send you via a link along with a survey for any post-webinar feedback. Um, I'd also like to let you know uh, about two trainings that Cyvers is doing in the next couple of months. Container Camp is a three-day intensive in March on everything about containers. Basically, bring your own data and analysis and come away with a working, running container. We're also offering something called FOSS, Foundational Open Science Skills Camp, which is a two-week uh, camp intensive in June intended for new PIs and early career researchers to provide them with uh, free open source computational resources and open science skills and best practices to implement into your projects. Um, I'll put the link in the chat window to our website learning page where you can read more about these trainings and to register. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Tyson Swetnam, who's a science analyst specializing in spatial data infrastructure at Cyverse. All right, thanks, Tina. All right, thanks everyone for uh, attending today. Uh, this is part two in a series of talks about containers, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what Julian went over two weeks ago. Okay, so Tina, just to make sure we're looking at my screen, I think we're good to go. Yes. Okay, so um, today we're going to go through uh, what Julian spoke about, um, working with containers, and then I'm going to take some time to go through uh, the process of building your own container and then um, what you can do with these containers once you have them. Uh, Julian talked a bit about uh, the reasons for why we use containers, and there are these problems that uh, software engineers have experienced for decades as far as uh, building software and then trying to run it on different pieces of hardware. And so you can imagine if you have a different operating system uh, with different types of software, it's changed over time, and then you try to run it on other pieces of metal, you encounter what uh, they call dependency hell. And so we have these two cartoons showing differences uh, in architecture. The slide on the right is an actual diagram of how Mozilla Firefox runs. And so if you break any one of those spaghetti noodles, uh, your software breaks down. So it's, it's hard to move software around. And uh, the solution that they've come up with is that you can containerize the software. And basically that means that you put it into a, an isolated environment that you can then run in another type of software uh, on different platforms that have that containerization software installed on them. And the reasons we do this uh, are that these dependencies, different pieces of software that are required to run other software uh, can quickly turn into wicked problems, the dependency hell. Compiling software uh, to run it each time is very slow. And every time you wanna take that software and run a new system, it can take a long time. Uh, the reproducibility aspect is difficult across different platforms, particularly if you're trying to do science. And then uh, really this benefit of, of having this portability and then also scalability that you can uh, run this anywhere and you can run it on many different platforms. So, you know, which software do we want to pick and use uh, for our research? Today, I'm going to highlight uh, two different platforms that we use extensively here at Cybers. Uh, the first one is Docker. It's a private company that's been around for uh, several years now and is, is now a mature technology. And the second is Singularity, uh, which is a, another software. And they're uh, a group called Scilabs that uh, they operate in a little bit of a different environment, uh, including high performance computing, which I'll, I'll get to in a bit. So which container is going to be the right one for you? Um, my suggestion would be that the first thing you should do is go on a repository like Docker Hub and look for your software. It, there's a chance that, that it already exists in a container on Docker Hub. And you can just take that container and use it um, somewhere. The second option would be to find a container that exists and maybe it has 95% of the dependencies that you use in your science. 
you can take that container and modify it and add in the last 5%. You can update it and then uh, make it your own. And then the last option, which I'll go through today, is, is creating your own container from scratch. So creating a recipe file and then uh, compiling that container from, from the ground up. Okay, so building your own Docker container. Uh, the, the root of a Docker image is a Docker file, which is basically a recipe. And what I have here in six lines is an entire Docker file for running uh, a set of code. So on the first line, I have a statement saying from, and that's uh, pulling an image uh, of an operating system. Now, here I'm using Linux Ubuntu, uh, the, the latest version, Bionic Beaver. I could also pull a lighter weight container if I wanted to run uh, some Linux Alpine or if I wanted to run a CentOS image or something from the Debian group. So these are, these are different operating systems which become the base of the image. On the second line, I, I'm listing who it is that created that container, and that's me. Um, this is not a required field, but it's good to put in there for documentation purposes, and so if other people are gonna come and use your container down the road, they can ask you questions. On the third line, I'm, I'm running a set of commands, and if you're familiar with Linux, you'll see that I'm updating the, the system before I install these three programs. Uh, these are, are just kind of funny game programs that were inspired by uh, the folks at Scilabs. But I'm updating it and then installing these three things. And so the container pulls the operating system and then installs these. I have uh, two sets of environment paths that I'm setting. So I'm adding in the user games path. And these, these three programs I'm installing are being installed into the games path. So once I add that in, I'll be able to, to type those commands and they'll execute. Uh, for this particular one, I'm setting the language uh, that I need those programs to run in. And then the last step is this entry point. And the entry point is going to be what happens when I run the container. And for this, I'm going to uh, tell it to, to do these three things together. So uh, it's give me a fortune, have a cow say it, and then use the coloration of the wall cat program. And so that, that's the recipe file. So that, that single file will live on a, a folder on your machine and then you execute it by using a command. Uh, you have to use the super user, so the sudo command, uh, docker build. And, and right here I'm giving it a tag. And the tag is gonna be my username uh, slash cow say. And then I'm gonna tell it that this is the latest version of the latest tag of the image. And then I'll, I'll do the dot here to say, run it on the, the contents of this directory. Um, and so that will build the container. And, and what I'll do right now is I'm going to try to exit my full screen. And I'll show you guys an example of this. So I'm going to create a directory. And then I'm gonna go into the directory. And then I'm going to say uh, nano docker file. And so this is going to give me this, this blank slate. And if I go back to here, I'm going to just go ahead and copy these real quickly and put these in here. And so what I've just done is I've copied the contents of the slide into this file. I'm going to save it. And I can see that the, the docker file now exists. And so now I want to build that Docker container. So I say sudo docker build the tag name t sweatnum tau say latest on the contents of the folder. I'm going to tell it my password. And so now the container is building. So it's, it's just pulled an image from uh, Docker uh, and it's got the Ubuntu image and it's, it's installing the updates and it's going to install my package. So this is gonna go through this process of building the container. And then once that container is built, I'll be able to do something with the container. And so it looks like it's finishing here. Okay, so the container now says that it's built and it has this tagged image called uh, cow say latest. And so if I wanna run the container now, I can say docker run. I'm gonna add in this little flag for interactive and the TTYL, which are um, specific to docker. And then I'll say uh, T sweatnum how say latest, oh, excuse me, yeah, just latest, and that should be on the view. Okay, so, so I've just run the container, and the container has given me a fortune, 
Uh, it's showing me the cow saying it, and it's colored it using the wall cat option. And so I can also enter the container into the, at the command line if I'd like. So I can say docker run rmit entry point bin bash for the terminal using the name of the container and the latest tag. And so now you see that my, my terminal has changed to show me the root. And then, so now I'm inside the container. So I can say something like fortune, and that'll tell me a fortune. If I say fortune pipe, how say, wall cat, I can get it to tell me another fortune. And so I'm still inside the container, just working inside of the container on the command line. So I'll exit the container. I'm back at my normal prompt. And so the, the next step of this is that I can push this container that I've just created back to Docker Hub, which is the repository where Docker maintains these containers. So I'll go ahead and say Docker push T sweatnum how say latest. And so what this is doing now is it's, it's sending this image up to Docker Hub as a public image for other people to, to see and to access. So this is leaving my computer and going up onto the internet. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to the full screen for a minute. Okay, so I've just created a Docker container and I've pushed it up to a Docker repository. And, and I'm sorry if I'm going quickly. Uh, Julian covered some of the initial aspects of containers uh, two weeks ago. So the, the second component of my talk is to cover this other platform called Singularity. And Singularity is a little different than Docker. It's, it's another type of container. And uh, one of the powerful aspects of Singularity is it allows you to run a container on a high performance computing system. So uh, just to, to make clear that Docker and Singularity work together interactively and they're, they're good friends. So one of the problems with Docker is that when you run a Docker container, you're a root. So if you're paying attention, you saw that when I was inside the container on the command line, I was a root user. Uh, high performance computing system managers are very unlikely to install Docker on their system because it allows you to run as a root user, which means that you could uh, have a, a bad actor come into your system and do bad things. What Singularity does is it, it launches a different type of container which emulates the host environment of the Linux system that you're on. It also allows you to maintain the same username uh, as the system that you're using. So that means that if you're on an HPC, you can run Singularity as yourself without root privileges. Now that's not to say that you, you don't have root. You can also run root inside of the Singularity container. Um, and then the other really powerful aspect of Singularity is it allows you to, to run other Docker images uh, in Singularity, which means you can take Docker and run it on any HPC system. Uh, the, the Singularity file is similar to the Docker file. It has a little bit of a different uh, syntax but in other ways, it's very much the same. So here, I'm, I'm gonna bootstrap uh, from Docker that same Ubuntu image that I built my first container with. Uh, instead here, I'm gonna add in a, a help option so I can say uh, what this container does if the user types singularity help on the image. And then instead of run, I have a post command. So when the image builds, it's going to do an app get update, and then it's gonna install those three programs, the same as I did in the Docker file. I can then set the environment in the, in the Docker file, it's the env command, but here we just say uh, with the environment, export the L LC and then also export the path. And then the last part is, is to do the run script. And this is analogous to the entry point that we saw in the Docker file. So when I wanna build that container, I can then just say sudo singularity build. Uh, here I'm using the singularity 2.6 and that uses a, an image file format called an SIMG. If you're using Singularity 3.0, that's using a .sif image, and then I'm pointing it at that Singularity file. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and do the same thing as I did just a moment ago. I'm gonna reduce my screen down so I can see my terminal again. And I'm gonna copy this so I don't have to type it, save it some time. Okay, so I'm gonna say uh, make dir Singularity. Uh, let's say Kause. CD Singularity Kause. I'm going to say nano Singularity. So I'm going to create the Singularity file. And then I'm going to paste in the contents of the file. So I've just uh, pasted and then saved it. 
and I can see that they're all there. And then I'm going to say pseudo singularity build. Let's make sure I get this right. Tau say RMG, and then use the singularity file. And so now this is pulling that same Ubuntu image from Docker um, into my computer, and it's going to start building this container. And so you can see for singularity, the commands are similar. Um, so we had a Docker run command. I can also do a singularity run command. Uh, but singularity has a couple other options where I can execute on the container different entry points. Um, and then I can also enter the shell. So I'll, I'll do that here in a moment once this container finishes building. Okay, so it looks like it's done. So now uh, another point is that the, this image exists in the same directory uh, as the singularity file. When I build a Docker image, it typically puts the Docker image into a, a different directory on my computer where Docker is installed. So I'll say singularity uh, run tau say. And then we see the tau telling us another fortune. So I can also say uh, singularity ex execute on the container, the, on this container. We'll, we'll tell it to tell us a fortune, just the fortune. And so then it, it, it gives us this random fortune. Um, I can do the shell command. And so now I'm into the shell um, of, of the container and say, who am I? And I'll see that I'm still T-swept. So I'm still the same user as I was when I started uh, this container. So I can now say fortune, hi, how say, and I can see my colorful cap. And then I can exit the container. Um, and then the, the last aspect that's really powerful is that I can push, or excuse me, I can pull a singularity, or excuse me, a Docker image into singularity. So what I can say here is singularity run from Docker hub, my Docker image that I created just a few minutes ago. And so what this is doing now is it's pulling the image from Docker Hub and running the Docker container. So I've, I've now shown that we can, we can build a, a Docker uh, container from a recipe file. I can build a singularity container from a singularity recipe file. And then I can run Docker inside of singularity. OK. So I, I want to pause for just a minute. Um, we'll see if anyone has any questions that they've typed into the chat. I'm sorry, I don't see the chat uh, feature right now. Looks like there are a couple questions. Yeah, it looks like we're okay. Does anyone uh, have anything they want to type into the chat about what I've just gone over? No? Okay, so I'm going to go on and continue. So some of these lessons that that we've learned um, in our experience building containers. Uh, there's this epigram on programming from Alan Perlis in 1982. So beware the Turing tar pit in which everything is possible, but possible, but nothing of interest is easy. And, and this goes to the idea that, you know, we can do whatever we want with code, but we want to try to keep things simple. Um, when we build containers, we don't want to make them too complex because then they get harder to manage. And so uh, just when you go out and start building your first containers, be aware that you want it to, to do a thing and not necessarily all things. Uh, and then this other takeaway is that, you know, going and building a container that will do what you want to do, it's going to take you some time and you're going to have to get some experience with that software before you'll be able to, to make containers that really work in the way that you need them to. And it, it doesn't take long, but, but don't get frustrated right away. Okay, um, so moving into the, the second half of the talk. So we've, we've kind of demonstrated uh, between Julian's talk two weeks ago and the beginning of my talk, um, how to build a container. So now you've got this container and you're ready to go do something with it. And I, I just wanna give you a couple of example use cases of how uh, we use containers here at Cyverse and how some of my colleagues use it. Uh, real quickly, an example of a, a user who's not necessarily a programmer, but someone that works in a graphic user interface day-to-day, uh, -day. they don't write a lot of code. They might work in an integrated development environment. But you're probably at this place where you're finding that you need more computing power than you can accomplish with your, your laptop or even your desktop.
but maybe you're in a situation where you can't afford to buy a really expensive, large workstation to do that work on. One thing that you can do is you can build a container. Um, this is an example from Cybers where we're running an Ubuntu desktop that we can run remotely using Docker. And so this is a public image that you can pull. And when you pull this image, you can then enter into an environment that looks like a desktop, and then you can use your software. In this example, I'm running uh, a desktop, which is uh, running a structured for motion program that I have. And I can run this program uh, on a, a GPU workstation, or I could run it on an HPC center. Another example would be um, someone who's interested in scaling the workflow up beyond laptops. So maybe you have lots of jobs that you need to run and you want to do those on an HPC or on a cloud service. So this is a diagram from some work that I did uh, recently where I'm using a container, specifically a, a Singularity container built from a Docker image. And it's hosted on the Singularity Hub. And I can run this resource from my laptop. Uh, I can run it on a cloud instance as a, a master that organizes the worker jobs. And I can run the same container on a larger computer, on a very large cloud instance, or even on an HPC center. And when I do this, these things can connect to each other and then communicate. So I have this horizontal scaling that I can accomplish. I can pull data from uh, remote data centers into those uh, containers and do work. And then when it's done, I can save those results back out. And so this is the example of what we did that with. So this is a solar radiation model uh, that is using a, a, public, a publicly available digital elevation model and it's running it uh, across an entire year. So each of these, these frames in the, in the video is a single day. And the container ran 365 times for each day across uh, many computers, and it finishes the job very quickly. Uh, another example uh, from using containers, so this is taking the idea and scaling it far out, so using uh, containers millions of times. So we can, we can do really highly parallel jobs, uh, this is Ariella Gladstein, who recently graduated from the University of Arizona, and she was working with genetics data looking at Ashkenazi Jews uh, and, and their, uh, their heritage across uh, Asia and the, and the European uh, uh, continent. And so she had this problem where she had, she calculated about 87 years worth of computer time, so 7 million hours and it was gonna take about three million jobs to assemble all these different genetic data she had. And so she was able to work with some folks here at Cybers and then some folks um, in California at the Information Sciences Institute who work on Pegasus. And she was able to create a container and then run that container three million times uh, on the open science grid. And so this is, this is a diagram of her workflow and that's basically the different parts of her container. And so, she was able to run that in just a few months and, and then graduate. And if you'd like to learn more, you can uh, click on the link from the talk and, and see uh, some of the aspects of that science. And so that this is a, an extreme example of being able to take the same container and then uh, run it through a high throughput service like the Open Science Group. Okay, um, I wanna talk about how you can take your containers and run them on Cybers. So uh, importantly, Cybers is enabled by people and the research that they bring to us. And, and our success as a, as a group depends on, on users coming into Cybers and then helping us innovate new ways to do our research. So, so Cybers is not a field of dreams. We don't build things and, and anticipate users showing up. Um, we need you to come here and, and tell us what it is that you want us to, to help you with. And then we have uh, engineers like Julian, who gave the first talk, um, that can help you accomplish your science. Okay, so, so how can you use containers inside of Cybers? So we have a, a service that we call Atmosphere. It's a cloud computing service. It runs in Linux. Um, it allows you to, to bring in your collaborators and work together. And then you can host uh, images on it um, of different operating systems or, or different containers. You can size your instance from a single core up to 16 cores and you get up to 128 gigabytes of RAM on a single instance. Um, and you can add uh, external volumes if you have large data sets. And then you can uh, even work with a, an emulated web shell or a remote desktop like that Apache Block Mobile. Uh, within Atmosphere, you can install Docker and Singularity or if you like using other um, uh, environments like Project Jupyter or Studio. And the way you can accomplish this is that you start a VM, 
you enter a terminal and you can type in the words EZD. And that'll show you some instructions for how to install either uh, Docker using the EZD command, Singularity using the EZS command, or you can install uh, Jupyter Notebooks uh, using Anaconda, and you can set the kernels either, you can install R or Python 2 or 3. You can also install a Jupyter Hub uh, just using the EZJH command. And so I have an example I'm gonna do in a moment where I'm gonna install Docker. I'm gonna install a program called uh, Portainer, which is an, a, a container orchestration program that's, that works in your browser. I'll add a, a user uh, myself to the Docker group so I don't have to use a sudo command. And then I'll have to exit the, the terminal and restart it. And then I'll pull uh, an RStudio container built in Docker um, from the Docker hub and then I'll run it. So let's, let's go back to my slide. And let's see if I can do this. So um, I am running in our atmosphere uh, a virtual machine. This thing has two cores and 16 gigs of RAM, 120 gigabyte root space. I'm gonna go ahead and open the guacamole web shell. So this is the emulated terminal. So this is a different terminal than I'm running up that I ran in the other background. Let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger for y'all. Okay. Okay, so what I'll do here is I'm gonna type in easy, and then that shows me the list of commands that I can do with easy. So I'm gonna install Docker in Portainer. I'm gonna say uh, easy d dash p to be my cyber's password. And so now that's installing Docker on this atmosphere instance. And that'll take just a moment. So while that's installing, we'll go back and look at my instructions. So after I've installed uh, Docker, I can add myself to the, the user group Docker. And all this is gonna do is it'll take away the, the need for me to use a sudo command uh, when I run Docker. Uh, I can exit that terminal and then open a new terminal and that'll have refreshed the properties. And then I'm gonna pull this container. Looks like we're still waiting for a moment. And, I, and I'll just say, if, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to, to add them in the chat while I'm, I'm speaking and I'll try to cover them during these installation times. Let's wait to talk about the discovery environment. Okay, so there, there's a question. Um, can we get access to the code from this tutorial? Yes, so this, uh, this tutorial is online and I'll, I'll give you the link to it um, in just a few minutes. So actually, I guess I'll just do that now while we're waiting. And this, this should be published on the Cybers website and then if not, you guys can contact me individually. Okay, so let's paste this in here. Okay, so this is the link to the top and uh, feel free to share that with all your friends. Okay, so we've, we've finished installing Docker. Um, there's a couple of things here that I'm gonna do. So we, you can see that when Docker finishes installing, it says it uh, was updated successfully. It says you shouldn't need to run EZD again unless you wanna update Docker. And then it has some instructions about using the sudo user mod. So I'm gonna say sudo user mod ag docker hyphen username. Here. Okay, so I've just added myself to the Docker group. And then before I close this terminal, I want to copy this address. This is Portainer. Oops. The, I will say that the Apache guacamole has uh, some interesting attributes about how to copy paste. So I have to uh, do this with a little uh, magic sauce. I closed the instructions before, but there's some key commands you do. Okay, so this is going to open a new uh, terminal window. I'm going to copy this secret password. And say admin, and then paste the password. Okay, so what this has just done is it's it's opened up Portainer on the machine that I'm using. Um, so this is Portainer running on the virtual machine, 
and it's showing me a list of the Docker containers that are on this machine. And right now, the only Docker container running on the machine is Portainer. So in my instructions, I have a Docker pull rocker. So I'm going to uh, exit this and we'll let this refresh. This should just take about 30 seconds. That's okay, gonna, okay, I'm gonna say Docker pull rocker geospatial latest. And so this is now going to pull uh, a fairly large image from Docker Hub. The geospatial container, I believe, is about two and a half gigabytes. Um, so one of the benefits of working in Atmosphere is that uh, this is running inside of our data center, which is built on Internet 2 backbone. And um, so you're, you're, being, you're able to move data around basically as fast as you can on any other uh, cyber infrastructure in the country. Okay, so we're almost done. We've pulled the container. I'm just going to extract contents. Okay, the question. So I said that you can choose operating system for your game. Uh, does that mean I can package a software pipeline that uses math libraries specific to Ubuntu and then put them in a container and run them on a Mac? Um, yeah, so you can, you can run Docker on, on a Mac using an Ubuntu container. Um, there are some, some problems with uh, building containers in Windows and then running them on Linux, um, but I believe you can run most Linux containers in Windows using Docker. Um, one, one thing I do want to emphasize, though, is that uh, we're, we're reaching the point with research computing that we're doing a lot of our work remotely, so we're not necessarily using our laptops. Um, Windows has come a long way in integrating Linux. You can run a new Ubuntu um, subsystem on a Windows 10 uh, machine, and so that you're able to, to basically do Linux operations um, from your Windows box. Okay, so we've just finished pulling the container. So I'm going to say Docker run. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell this container to remove itself when it's done. I'm going to run it in the detached mode. I'm going to tell it to run on port 8787 87, on the inside and the outside of the container. I'm going to tell it um, to in the environment to reset the password to password. So we'll just do this to make it simple. And then I'm going to tell it that I want to run rocker latest. Okay, so I've, this set of commands, because I've told it to run in a detached mode, when I execute this, it just did that. So it showed me the name of the container and then it dropped me back into the terminal. If I hadn't run it in detached, it would be showing me the outputs of starting RStudio. So, uh, our studio server runs on the IP address of the machine with the port that I just gave it. And so now uh, this, this specific container uses the username RStudio. And so what I've done is I've, I've selected the IP address of my virtual machine and that port that I told the container to start on, and now I've just dropped into RStudio. And this is running the the geospatial version of our studio that uh, Rocker supports. So I have tools like GDAL and Geos uh, built into here. And so if I refresh my portainer, I can now see that I'm also running uh, a Rocker container. And it looks like it's bigger than I said. It's actually a four gigabyte size image. So we've, we've now started a, an R Studio instance on Cybers and we're, we're ready to do some, some research. Okay. So uh, the other aspect of Cybers I wanted to show you is our discovery environment, which is our data science workbench. And the discovery environment allows you to bring your own Docker containers and integrate them as tools. Um, a, a tool is a multi-purpose platform. So that it could be something um, like PDAL, which is a LiDAR uh, set of tools that I use. And each app that I build from that would be a specific command line execution. And what this does is it, it takes away the need to work on a, on a terminal. So if you have users that aren't experienced working in the command line, they can use your, your graphic interface tools that you've integrated into the discovery environment. Uh, my colleague, Upender Devashetti, uh, published a paper a couple years ago that you can access on F1000 on how to bring your containers into the discovery environment. And we also host documentation in our learning center on how to do this. 
Uh, recently, Cybers released a new platform, which we're calling uh, VICE, the Visual Interactive Computing Environment. And this is a way that you can launch interactive containers. And those can be things like the, the Guacamole Desktop, uh, Jupyter Lab, uh, Shiny Apps, our studio. And the way that, that uh, VICE works is that you enter the discovery environment using your laptop. Um, you can access the data in Cybers that you put on our data store. And then you can launch one of our uh, pre-configured apps. Those can be our studio, Jupyter, um, or you could bring your own. And then uh, just for those that are interested, this is all being orchestrated on the back end using uh, Kubernetes and an HD Condor cluster uh, using the Docker containers that we've, we've built. So let me show you that. Let's exit full screen again. Okay, so here I have uh, my discovery environment is open. I've logged into it. And I have in the apps tab, so when you first enter the discovery environment, it should be empty. There's a, a button for opening your data folder, which will show you the contents of your, your data store account. I can click on the apps folder, and this should show me the different apps that have been integrated into Cybers. Um, if I click on the interactive apps, I should see some of the device applications that are available. I've gone ahead and started a few of these apps. And so I have um, already running a Jupyter Lab. So I press on the button and it drops me into a virtual machine running Jupyter Lab. Uh, I can look at a Shiny app that I have running that we've built. And so these, these apps are all public, so users can come in and, and select them and run them. And then if you'd like to bring your own app into the discovery environment, um, from the apps window, you can click on manage tools. And these are the tools that other people have already integrated. And then you can add a tool and you'll see a screen that, that asks you to give the name of the tool, um, the version of the, the image, the image name and the tag, and it's hosted location on Docker Hub. So if you create a, a Docker container and host it, you can bring it here in the cybers. You can create an interactive app uh, like Jupyter or our studio, and then you can set the entry point for it. You can select the number of cores it wants to use and the amount of RAM it wants to use. Okay. So um, with that, I'm almost done with my presentation, but uh, for anyone who is, has not had a lot of experience working in data science, working on the command line, um, you can uh, visit a, a really great group called the Carpentries. And they offer uh, data science training, both in person and online. You can uh, complete their tutorials by yourself, or you can attend a workshop, um, which they host around the country uh, pretty much every weekend. There are carpentry workshops going on around the world, um, but many here in the United States. If you'd like to learn about cybers, you can go to our learning center. And I just want to point out that uh, throughout this talk, all of these uh, text icons are hyperlinked. And this will take you to our Read the Docs documentation about how to use the different aspects of Cybers. Uh, Cybers is teaching a container camp in person here in Tucson on uh, March 6th to the 8th. You can learn more by going to this URL. A little bit later in the summer, we're teaching an extended two-week uh, camp uh, to teach foundational open science skills. So we'll be covering the whole gamut of reproducibility from working in version control systems like GitHub, to using containers, to working on HPC, and then how to, how to create uh, reproducible research objects. And you can learn about that by going to Cyber's Fox. Uh, I just wanna uh, quickly say thank you to the folks at uh, Scilabs and Dave Godlove for teaching me about fortune telling cows, so I could show you that today. Uh, thanks to Julian, Upendra, and Narav uh, for helping with the slides, and thanks to Matt for uh, enabling a lot of this science, uh, particularly my work, and Ariella's work uh, through Pegasus, Exceed, and Open Science Group. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there, and, and we can take questions, and I think we have enough time that we can maybe do some more demos if, if people would like to see anything. So thank you. Thanks, Tyson. Are there any questions? Um, if, feel free to unmute yourself, because um, sometimes typing into the chat can get cumbersome. Okay. 
All right. Well, Tyson, thank you very, very much. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, if you want to hang out for a few more minutes, Tyson can has a few minutes to spare before he heads off and can um, address any uh, additional questions. Tyson, did you want to run through a demo at this point? We have some time. Um, no, I'll wait and see if anyone has anything specific. And then okay. Okay. In the meantime, I wanted to let you know about our uh, next webinar, which is going to be on the 22nd of February. It's going to be on bio containers by Amanda Cooksey. Uh, this webinar will build on the foundation that Julianne and Tyson have provided on containers, and it'll show you how to find and integrate publicly available bioinformatics containers for genomic, proteomic, metabolomic, and transcriptomic analyses into cybers so you can bring your reproducible workflows right to where your data is. Um, also, please note that the webinar that was originally scheduled for March 8th will be postponed due to uh, conflict with Container Camp, but the webinars will resume on March 22nd. So if there's no further questions, I'm gonna give you a couple seconds here to type anything in or unmute yourself. Um, but otherwise, thanks everyone for attending, and we'll see you online in a couple weeks. Okay, um, so we got we got a question. So, is there a reason to make uh, multiple containers for workflows, uh, and then somehow link them together? And then, so I'll, I'll answer that first. So, yeah, there are there are containers that that actually work uh, in orchestration together. And that one example would be using a part of Docker called Docker Compose. Um, I actually have a container that I can show you right now that's doing that. Am I still sharing my screen? I believe I am. Yes. Okay, so I have I have this uh, web open drone map running on a virtual machine. Let's see if this works. So if I say Docker PS, it's a little big right there, but um, let me see if I can reduce the size of that so they all kind of line up. So this is a single container that's running and it's using Docker Compose to orchestrate itself. So it's still not small enough, but um, this particular application is, is running as, as a node, as, a, as the web open drone map. And it's, um, it's just the way that this particular application is designed that it has different containers doing different things and they're all talking to each other. So that's one example of how you could uh, do multiple containers that are working at once. There are other ways that you can run containers that are dependent on other containers in a workflow, and that, that would be similar to like what Ariella showed with her Simprilly app on uh, Open Science Grid. Okay, and then um, another reason why you'd, you'd want to run a container in a detached mode uh, would be that if you run it in a terminal and your terminal becomes disconnected, then the container will die. So you want to be able to start that container and run it as a background process so that it, it doesn't go away if you close your terminal. Let's see if we can look at web open drone up right now. So this is my web open drone map that I have running on this virtual machine. And it's it's run a, a drone flight for me. All right, well, I'll wait another couple minutes and if there aren't any more uh, questions, then I think we can go ahead and hang it up for today. So my, my contact information are listed on the Cyrus website. They're listed at the beginning of this uh, presentation, which I've given the link to in the chat. So feel free to contact me um, any way you want, either on uh, social media or through email, and I'll, I'll see if, if we can get a meeting to talk about uh, what you need to do for your research.
Okay, if there are no more questions, um, as Tyson said, you can always reach Tyson and other scientific analysts at our website. And uh, I think you provided your, your email contact earlier. So thank you everyone, and we'll see you hopefully online in a couple of weeks.